Hello, hello. So um, I'm Stefan Graber. I've got Christian Brunner. We're both uh, we both work at Canonical on Lexi, LexD, and LexCFS. And today we're going to be going over how to set up a home cluster, um, something that you could use for like a home lab or for a small uh, small team lab environment. Let's get into that. Yes. Um... So most of us probably know, so people who are familiar with uh, Lexi and with uh, Lexi will probably know us from uh, for our container work. This is, uh, yeah, this is what we're most uh, experienced in. But we have ventured into new areas with Lexi that we will talk a bit about this as well. Um, so I guess most people nowadays are kind of acquainted with containers, but it might help to give a quick re recap. Uh, containers are, um, well, actually, there is no container concept on Linux. Um, this is always the famous dictum that containers are a, a user space fiction. So that just means that the Linux kernel isn't actually aware of, doesn't have an in-kernel container object. You can't just uh, perform a system call and suddenly you're in a container. And it is, this is very different from, from other systems. Instead, uh, Containers are made up of very different uh, kernel interfaces. Most of them have to do with resource isolation or with um, security. Um, um, the most famous one are usually namespaces. We have eight namespaces by now on Linux. The last edition was the time namespace. Um, and they isolate certain aspects of the system, such as the mount table or uh, UIDs and GIDs. This would be the user namespace, the pit namespace. Um, and then we also have C groups, which is uh, which concern themselves with resource isolation, um, and there are various other interfaces that become important when you're trying to build a full working container. Um, and for us, this the goal has always been uh, to create something which is a system container, which is in contrast to application containers. So application containers are usually containers that run a single binary uh, inside a single process. So they don't boot a full system. And in contrast to that, a system container is a container that runs a full unmodified uh, Linux system. It has always been our goal. So we make use of every available kernel interface that provides additional security to containers. We develop quite a bunch of these features in the upstream kernel. We integrate them into our products. And we have we organize quite a bunch of conferences um, around, uh, around this stuff. So system containers are, in contrast to application containers, the oldest types of containers, as you can see. We've also noted this on the slides. Um, they have a long history, actually, containers. So <clears throat> Linux hasn't spearheaded this concept. They have existed in in the form of BSD jails, where they are actually a, and Stefan can correct me if I'm wrong, where they are actually um, a property of the kernel. So there is an in-kernel object, in-kernel container object, the same for Zolaris zones. There was an implementation of something similar in the form of the Linux, Linux V servers. Um, there was open vset. Um, and then around 2008, uh, Lexi started, and then in 2000, around 2014, 2015, uh, Lexi was was started. Um, and in between, around 2013, the whole application container thing that we know nowadays uh, has become more and more, uh, yeah, more and more associated with what a container actually is. So, but our containers behave like a standalone uh, system. So we don't need any special software. We don't need any special images or root events. We can basically, if you have a tool to create uh, an image or root events from your distro, um, then you can use this. And uh, LexD, uh, in this case, will exactly know what to do with this. And you can just start the container. Um, the advantages that this is really low overhead they're very easy to manage. Um, this is something to do with how we designed the API, um, which Stefan will be talking about later on. Um, and so you can run thousands or ten thousands on a single system, um, and they're managed just as like a single bunch, uh, like a, a bunch of processes. It's very transparent, so you see all of the processes that run in the container appear in the process tree of your um, 
of your system in contrast to, for example, a virtual machine. Um, but as I promised, um, we're also ventured into, uh, into new territory. While the goal is obviously, or has always been uh, with system containers, um, that we uh, uh, that uh, that they cover every use case that virtual machines that you normally would use virtual machines for that isn't necessarily always the case. There are still some limitations, like for example, we can't fake or virtualize hard hardware, um, and that is why virtual machines became sort of a natural extension. Um, and we have already had experience in this area. So this is uh, why Lexly now can, is also able to manage virtual machines. Um, well, there's obviously a very, uh, very obvious uh, glaring difference and that is that containers uh, and containers share the same kernel with the host. Uh, that is for example, also a limitation. So if you want to run a new, newer or older kernel, um, you can't do this with containers. You would need to update your host. Um, they also have virtualized hardware in, in firmware and they behave much more like a, uh, like a physical system uh, in a lot more detail than a container or system container would. Um, they are uh, hardware accelerated due to how the Linux kernel works and the KVM module in the kernel. Um, and useful virtualization actually requires hardware's, uh, hardware support. Um, and then there are a bunch of other ways that you can also make virtual machines operate faster. Uh, for example, from using virtualization aware devices, uh, Bird IO devices, these are usually called. Um, and these, uh, this is a trend also in the upstream kernel. So usually when uh, a piece of virtualized hardware becomes important enough, then there will also be a virtual virt IO driver for this. You also have new file systems developed that you can use with virtual, virtual machines that try to make up for some of the limitations uh, that you have with virtual machines in terms of IO performance and sharing directories and folders with them. Um, uh, with the host, uh, which is very easy to do with containers and which is obviously for obvious reasons, very difficult with virtual machines. And another advantage is that it can just uh, run about any operating system. So with system containers, you are obviously constrained um, to running Linux distributions. You can, not for example, run, I don't know, Mac OS or Windows in virtual machines. Um, so if you have use cases, oh yeah, if you have use cases or workloads where you require Windows, then uh, virtual machines are obviously the way to go. Um, and newer versions of LexD um, will actually support this. Um, Okay, so kind of going over what, what LexD itself is. Uh, Christian already did a bit of an overview of that, but uh, LexD is effectively a container, system container and virtual machine manager. We don't directly care about application containers. Uh, you can run your Docker containers nested inside LexD, uh, either inside a virtual machine or inside a LexD system container. Both work just fine. Um, LexD is, but LexD's focus is really on giving you like a, a way of managing effectively machines, like instances that run full operating systems. It's uh, really quite simple. Uh, we've got a, a clean command line interface uh, that drives a REST API. So it's easy for, for external tooling to integrate with LexD. Um, it acts in much the same way as a local cloud on your machine. Uh, it's really, it's image based, so you don't have to go through either manually assembling the root file system of a container or manually installing a virtual machine. Uh, we've got pre-made images, and that's that makes things much faster, much more reproducible. It's very fast. Uh, it's got optimized storage and a migration API. It's got support for a variety of direct hardware pass-through, both into containers and virtual machines. It's also designed to be secure. So we did a lot of kernel work around the user namespace, and we were definitely early adopters of that uh, in LXC, but it was quite difficult uh, to, to make use of it and more, more importantly, not the, def not the default. Uh, with LexD, containers are privileged by default. The user namespace is used by default, and we do use 
um, things like seccomp and apama uh, by default on all of our instances. You can go and tweak things. You can always make them less secure. Uh, you can also make them more secure at the cost of some features. But we do have a stance that we want things to be to be safe by default. Uh, it's quite scalable. Uh, you can go from running LexD just on your you know laptop, desktop, Chromebook, um, and then move from that local experience to running on a few servers, like we'll be showing you today with some random development boards. Uh, or you can deploy it on a, on large clusters, you know, like rack scale, 40, 50 machines uh, that can run tens of thousands of instances. The API will be the exact same one. Uh, something that you write that can interact against your laptop will be able to interact against a massive cluster just the same. There are additional fields that become available as you end up in an environment that cross multiple systems. But if you don't understand those fields, it's perfectly fine. Next, they will just try to balance things for you and take away any any of the any of those new new features. Um, Lexi itself is written in Go. It uses uh, libelxe to drive the, the kernel container bits, and it uses QEMU for the virtual machine layer. Uh, as I said, it exposes a REST API for its clients, and we've got a number of those. We've got our own CLI tool, which is what we'll be showing in, in, in the tutorial part later. Um, but there's, there are also other clients like Ansible, uh, Juju, Open Nebula. There are bunch of others that and language bindings as well to integrate with FlexD directly. Um, and here on, in the slide, you can see kind of how things might look like in uh, Lexi deployment with multiple hosts where they all run Linux. Um, they then run LXE or QEMU. Well, or, or they can use both. You can totally run virtual machines and containers on the same system. Uh, so they run that layer, and then Lexd sits on top. It exposes the REST API, and then we've got clients talking to that. Uh, what's not shown in that in that diagram is what happens with a cluster, where the bottom layer would pretty much merge together inside like a single mm -hmm. API endpoint that would be combining all your machines into just one, instead of having their own per machine view. Um, as far as kind of the components of of Lexd, let's go through the the main, the main ones. Um, obviously, LexD runs instances. So it's what you see kind of in the middle. Uh, instances can have snapshots and backups. So that's additional endpoints for that. They are created from images. Images can have aliases, because we reference our images based on their SHA-256. And it's not really pleasant to type those. So we've got nice names that you can use on top of them. Um, we've got networks and storage, because you usually need those two bits uh, for a working instance. So you can create uh, a variety of different type of networks through LexD directly. And for storage, we also support uh, a variety of storage drivers, uh, things like BRFS, ZFS, LVM, Ceph, CephFS, and plain old directory of things we support. You can create storage volumes on top of those storage pools. Uh, those volumes can themselves have snapshots. And those volumes can be attached to instances, whether they're containers or virtual machines. And you can then easily do shared storage between them that way. Uh, there's also the cluster layer at the top here, um, which lets you scale the cluster, but also you know list its state and see that everything is working as, as expected. And somewhat recently, we've introduced the, the concept of projects, which lets you segment your LexD um, into, into like multiple chunks, effectively. Uh, that each can have then the same instance names, but not see each other's instances. Uh, that's quite convenient when you've got multiple software that might be deploying like the instances, and you're worried that they might do configuration changes that impact each other, or that they might just come up with the same instance name and similarly conflict. Um, so that feature lets you separate things. In a shared environment, it can also be used to give uh, each user of a shared cluster, for example, its own view of the, the entire thing. Then we've got a few internal endpoints, uh, things like certificates. That's to manage uh, access to the to LexD over the REST API, because we use TLS for that. We've got an endpoint that gets you live events of what's going on in LexD. We've got another endpoint that shows you all the background operations that LexD is running. And then we've got a few more APIs that are not even listed there that sit on top of the instances for things like file transfer, executing commands, 
attaching to the live console of the instance or even publishing an instance or an instance snapshot into a new image that you can distribute. Yep. So um, uh, a lot of the question uh, that you might have is where is LexD actually used? Well, actually, is uh, LexD is used in quite a few interesting workloads, which is going to highlight um, two a little bit. Um, so currently, on most recent Chromebooks, uh, the new Linux subsystem that they've implemented um, is based on LexD. So it uses LexD internally. Um, it, they implemented, they basically implemented a client tool uh, for LexD, but they also, with some trickery, let you uh, give you access to the LexD client tool itself. So you can actually not just run uh, the man, well, mandated uh, Linux distribution uh, or container uh, that uh, Google wants you to run. You can run any uh, any container on a Chromebook, any container that LexD supports. Uh, on a Chrome, so this is pretty. Uh, this is pretty cool. Any new Chromebook will be rolled out with this feature. You can enable it, and then it's powered purely by uh, LexD. It runs unprivileged containers by default. As we've said, this is a stance that we're taking. Everything should be super secure, and this is Chromebooks uh, are designed for exactly that purpose, being as secure as possible. So this fits nicely into the into the story. And it relies on a lot of the things that Stefan just mentioned before, snapshots. Uh, it uses our backup API, which we have. Um, it uses file transfer and uh, USB GPU and generic Unix device password that Stefan will probably mention uh, later on. The file transfer API is especially uh, is especially so uh, is especially cool because you can uh, push and pull files from and into the container. It also makes um, uh, use of our ability to expose and share directories between the host and the container. So any files that, for example, if you install an app on a Chromebook that runs on Linux. Um, then and you store files, it will go into a dedicated folder that you can access from the host. So it's tightly integrated uh, with uh, the, with the whole Chromebook itself. That's uh, so it's it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. It's pretty exciting uh, uh, work actually. Um, and we also uh, Lexi is also used to. Uh, Power ARM64, Power PC64, Little Indian, uh, and S390X um, workloads on Travis. Uh, so if you have any, if you test on these kinds of architectures, they will make use of LexD. And the cool thing is that they make use of very advanced features in LexD that we have that we didn't even that we don't have separate slides for, but um, they are pretty they are pretty interesting in and of itself. Um, so obviously, um, they're running containers. They're not using the virtual machine uh, parts of LexD. And uh, because it, obviously, these are architectures usually uh, that are either very expensive or not as widely available. So they need to be, they need to make sure that they run, can run jobs as densely as possible. And for that, containers are just super nice. And both LexD and LexD build on all of these architectures. We almost build on any architecture. Um, that you can think of, but especially for these, it's pretty cool. Um, and since they're running unprivileged containers, but often users have use cases where they want to make use of more advanced features, like sometimes your workloads need to create device nodes, or your workloads need to mount something that you wouldn't be able to mount. Um, so we've implemented a feature in the kernel that is called syscall interception that allows you to intercept and emulate syscalls in User space, uh, user, space, user space, which is pretty powerful. So usually any make not syscall inside of a container would fail because that's just how user namespaces work and it's a security mechanism. So you cannot uh, use this to attack the host. So otherwise you could create random device nodes for block devices and character devices. And then suddenly you could write into random kernel memory or you could get access to a device that you shouldn't have access to. Um, but at least for some of the for some of the devices, uh, LexD can guarantee that it's safe to create and use them. Um, for example, Dev0 and Dev Null, we already bind mount them in from the host. 
So we already vouch for them to be safe. So there is no reason why workloads, for example, when you run deep bootstrap or something else inside of container, why they shouldn't be able to create uh, device nodes, these device nodes. Um, so the second syscall interception work basically blocks the process inside of the container that performs the syscall and then will call out, the kernel will inform Alexi container manager that a syscall for a device has been made that we think is safe to do. And then Lexi will inspect the arguments um, will, and will verify that uh, the container is doing something, the process that is doing the syscall is doing something sane. And if it's, decide, if it's decided uh, that this is okay, it will then create a device node for the container um, and uh, so the make not syscall inside of the container will succeed. And then it will instruct the, the uh, kernel to report back success to the process that performed the syscall. This is something which we extended quite a bit. Um, you can nowadays, we are, we're thinking about making this even more powerful so that, for example, that workloads like Travis or workloads that you have can, can even do more interesting things. We made, made it possible to inject file descriptors into a task and to retrieve file descriptors from a task. So you could technically intercept the open syscall and then open a file descriptor for a file or directory that the container would usually not be able to open and then inject the file that the Lexi container manager opened for the container into the process uh, and then make the open succeed. So this is a pretty powerful mechanism that you can also use for rerouting, networking, and so on. And this is uh, this is powering Travis. So this is pretty uh, pretty cool. So pretty excited about that. Yeah. So on and like some of the the requirements around Travis was also to create those instances as quickly as possible. Um, and to have Docker be fully usable inside of the instance. So that's that's what drove a lot of that stuff. Uh, like we're, the, for the on the creation side, Travis is effectively using uh, LexD with ZFS on NVMe drives so that you can, and like a pre, we've got a pre-created container that gets copied on a per drop basis. Uh, that can take as little as a second effectively uh, to, to create and start that container. So that's very, very quick. And then separately, um, a traditional ext4 uh, volume is attached for Docker um, to be, to to run against, and that's where some of the Cisco interception comes into play to make uh, to make Docker work properly inside that environment. We also like, had to to be quite strict on on limits and restrictions to make sure that. Uh, one workload can't affect another, and that the workload can't harm the the host system, and that it will in it will go away once it's done. Uh, so it's it's quite good to see it um, used at this scale and with that kind of environment. Yep. And we promised you. Uh, uh, so talking about this, the container use case now uh, first. Uh, we promised you that we, you could run basically any Linux distribution inside of containers that you care about. Um, and this is just a rather random and non-complete selection, I think, of, uh, the con of the images that we provide. Maybe it's, it's, is it all of them, Stefan? No, it's not. Uh, yeah. there, we have a few logos on there. We actually support uh, building, well, we currently built 20 different distributions so that wouldn't quite fit. Um, and we, uh, yeah, yeah we, we built like 20 distros across 94 releases uh, for containers, which is like 390 images we build daily. And all of these, um, all of these images uh, are based on, if available, uh, are based on the official, on the official images that these distributions distribute. So if your uh, distro has an official image, then uh, we will use this. If it doesn't, but it provides a way to generate these images in an in an official way by providing <clears throat> by providing a process then we uh, <clears throat> then we will do this then we will do, do this instead so there's nothing modifi modified about these um, about these images uh, and uh, yeah as Stefan said they're generated daily uh, we have a huge build farm to support this um, and you can see we have Alpine Alt Linux uh, OpenSUSE Fedora Ubuntu uh, so, Oracle Linux, even Debian, of course, Arch Linux, CentOS, Gentoo Linux, and uh, and also Ubuntu Core. 
Um, and this is, we are serving currently over half a million images every uh, month, which is in this case downloads, not, not launches of, uh, of container, container images. So, uh, and this is, uh, as, far as, I, as far as I can tell, this is just going up um, over time. So we're pretty, <clears throat> pretty uh, excited about that about this because it shows that uh, Lexi is seeing, seeing, is seeing more and more adoption. Um, and nowadays, <clears throat> since we started supporting uh, virtual machines, which we mentioned before, obviously we also build virtual machine uh, images, not, not as much as we, not as many, I think, as we do for, um, uh, for containers, but still quite a lot. Um, and so you can launch you can launch virtual machines in the exact same way that you can launch containers, which Stefan will then later on show um, in the demos, which makes it a cool experience because there is no uh, uh, there is no difference in experience between launching a container and between um, launching a VM. So there you have it. Um, yeah. Might be worth mentioning that the, the image build process, the way we effectively do it for that, is we first assemble the container image. Uh, so we pull from the from the upstream distro image or whatever artifact we can get our hands on. We turn that into a container root file system. We generate that image, and then as a, as a second step, we install kernel and bootloader in that same image, and we generate the uh, virtual machine image from it. So the actual, like, if you install for the same build, the container and the virtual machine, you'll know that all the packages are going to be at the exact same version, the exact same location, the exact same thing, because they are the same thing. We've literally just added a camera and, and uh, bootloader from the distro um, before sp spitting out the uh, VM image. That's really the only difference. Yeah, so that's pretty neat. Right. Um, so LexD system containers, we've touched a bit uh, on this before, um, but it's probably uh, worth going over this in a, a, little, in a little bit, uh, in a little more uh, detail. Um, so this is our, uh, well, yeah, this is the, our area of expertise, uh, of expertise. This is where we uh, have the most experience um, in. And uh, I think it's safe to say we have the most featureful and safest system containers out there. Um, and we're still leading in feature development um, in the kernel and also in user space to make as many workloads uh, uh, in our containers possible as we can do. I mean, this can range. So this can range from, for example, we've written a tiny fuse file system that emulates certain proc files that uh, show host values to show container specific values, which is quite important. Think, for example, about sorry, about running a Java workload inside of a container, and um, the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, uh, will look at how many CPUs avail are available um, on your system. Um, and let's say, for example, you dedicated a single CPU or two CPUs. Uh, to the container so it can only run tasks on two specific CPUs. Um, and Java checks proc CPU info and then detects that your system actually has 256 uh, uh, threads uh, and will then start to spawn 256 threads or even worse when it reads your system memory from proc and finds out that you have uh, 64 gigabytes of RAM available, but you've only given your container a gigabyte of RAM, and then JVM will decide it wants to allocate eight gigabyte or 16 gigabyte of RAM, uh, then you're obviously going to run into problems. Um, so this is why we wrote LexCFS. It, for example, it virtualizes, uh, it virtualizes CPU info and all of the memory information based on the C groups that the container is in. Um, so we do a lot of this. We do a lot of this stuff that um, is more or less behind the scenes because it just enhances your experience of a system container. But it's actually quite crucial and is also quite critical and uh, and uh, and interesting work and something that we maintain um, as well. So I, I touched. Uh, this sort of relates to the uh, comprehensive and flexible resource limits too. Um, 
So uh, we have CPU limits, uh, which I talked about. You can, for example, limit the number of cores that you expose to the container, but you can also determine how much uh, how much shares uh, CPU shares the container have. Um, so this is a there's a very fine grained API that uh, Stefan developed for uh, and designed for LexD. You can obviously also limit memory. I mentioned this in the JVM example too, um, so that you can make sure that your container only has one gigabyte of memory available so that it can't exhaust uh, the memory limits of the host. Um, we can have network limits, I think, in uh, in throughput, uh, in ingress and egress limits, right? Um, we uh, and can specify your MTU limit. We also have limits on on storage. This is, but this is obviously specific to uh, the storage driver that is used. So if you're using ButterFS, then you can use ButterFS quotas. If you're using ZFS at your backend, which LexD supports then we're using um, ZFS quotas. Um, and uh, if you're using LVM, we're using a different kind of quota, XFS quota. So, um, but in general, um, we make sure that you can also limit, uh, limit storage, your storage consumption, I'm sorry. Um, and we also have limits on the number of processes so that you can, for example, say this container is only allowed to have run that many processes. Again, this is done through C groups. And we also expose or let you configure uh, various kernel limits. Like usually you don't really need to think about this too much because uh, LexD will uh, uh, choose sane defaults. This is the general idea, but you might have specific workloads that make it necessary that you have very fine grade control over how many memory you expose to the container, how many CPUs you expose to the container and so on. And so you, uh, we have this all documented obviously, and then you can look at all of the limits um, that, we, that we have. Um, one of the interesting uh, features one of the interesting features um, is device uh, pass-through um, because this is really exciting, right? We have talked about, uh, we have briefly touched upon the fact that virtual machines are limited in the sense they, that they need to virtualize a lot of devices, which obviously makes them slow. And I mean, you have PCI pass-through and so on, and that's obviously a, a nice solution, but with containers, this is uh, way easier. One of the obvious examples is uh, you want to uh, you want to expose a GPU to the container to, for example, run uh, an otherwise isolated uh, computation intensive workload, TensorFlow, or what have you, inside of the inside of the container. And GPUs are just very nice for this. So we expose and you can expose GPUs directly to the container. We provide you with an API for that. We've also integrated or a bunch of um, Friends at NVIDIA helped us to also make it possible to easily pass through uh, NVIDIA GPUs, including all of the CUDA libraries that you need to the uh, to the container because there is a dependency between um, the driver that is used for the NVIDIA GPU and the user space uh, libraries that are used to run the your workloads. And if you, for example, run an older distribution inside of the kernel and install the CUDA libraries, then you might get into conflicts with the uh, with the actual GPU driver that is used on the host. So we provide an API where the CUDA libraries from the host are made available uh, to the to the container. We also let you pass through network devices. Um, so you, for example, if you have a server with multiple network cards, physical network cards, you could decide that this container is supposed to get its own physical network device and then you can pass it into the container. Um, now the separate, uh, I guess the separate network device case is not the most common one to be honest, but if you think about InfiniBand devices where you have, where you split uh, a physical uh, function into multiple virtual functions, so into separate virtual network devices that are still very, very fast um, and you can have, have up to, I don't know, 200, 500 of those. And then you can tell XD to take one of those devices and pass it in the container. We also expose all of the character devices that belong to this. Um, and uh, LexD will take care to correctly detect all this. So this is pretty advanced as well. Um, and we also allow you to hot plug USB devices. This is pretty cool and a nice feature that I use a lot. 
Um, so for example, when I need to do uh, something on my phone, I usually don't want to install on my Android phone in this example. I usually don't want to install all of the 80 Android development kits and so on on my host. And then remember to uninstall them and clean up all the configuration files. Instead, I can just install them in a container and then tell Lexd to expose my uh, my phone um, based on the vendor ID or the product ID uh, to the container, and then I can just uh, mess with my uh, with my phone in the container. So this actually this is really powerful and really um, flexible. We can also uh, nowadays detect when you, for example, tell Lexd uh, you want your YubiKey. Uh, to be automatically automatic made available in the container automatically. Uh, we are able to detect this as well. So you can hot block devices. So you, if you uh, take it out of your computer, uh, your YubiKey or your phone, then Lexd will remove the device. And if uh, you plug it back in, then Lexd will detect it and create the device node again for you. Pretty powerful mechanism. I like it a lot. Um, we also allow you to uh, make disk devices available to the container, which in this case usually mean, uh, like for example, you want to mount a directory inside of a container or some sort of dedicated disk that you created for the container to share a data and um, um, storage between containers, between multiple containers. That's actually uh, quite an interesting use case. So you can hot block additional storage volumes um, to a container. And that's all done at runtime. I should say that like all of these things can be done while the container is running. So you never need to restart the container to do any of this stuff. And obviously we, we uh, allow you to uh, add arbitrary char character and block devices. So you either give Lexd a path for an existing block device and Lexd will create it in the container for you or um, you give it the main, minor and major number of the character block device and Lexd will create it for you, even though it doesn't might not even exist uh, on the host. As long as you have the driver available in the kernel, that that should work fine. Um, so this is pretty powerful, and we allow you to hot plug uh, Unix hot plug Unix character and block devices uh, too. Um, and then we have a bunch of advanced features, a very specific feature which we have briefly touched upon uh, already is the system call interception work that powers Travis. So there is no need to actually go into this with more detail. But we also care about, uh, for example, we also take care if you help plug a USB device inside of a container or a, a YubiKey or a network device. Uh, well, actually network devices are not a good example, but USD devices uh, or your YubiKey um, then what the kernel usually does, it generates a U event. And um, this U event exists to indicate to, uh, for example, UDEP, which is a device management daemon uh, that usually nowadays is shipped alongside systemd, to make it aware that a new device has been, has been uh, added to the system and that it can now start to initialize that device or run hooks or whatever, what have you. And these U events traditionally weren't namespaced. And so you would only see them in the initial user namespace, meaning you would not see them in the container, even though the device had just been created or hot plugged into the container, which is why we did some work to actually inject um, U events into the container. So when you now hot plug your USB stick uh, in and Lexd creates it for you, it will also uh, reroute that U event into the container. So if you have any device, if you any device management software, in your container waiting for this device to show up, um, then uh, it can get notifications via U event because Lexd is taking care of you. So this is pretty nice. Um, we also, in terms of security, allow you to generate isolated ID maps, um, not generate isolated ID maps, but running containers with isolated ID maps. What this means is each container has a non-overlapping UID and GID mapping. Uh, which provides additional security because containers can't exhaust each other's R limits. Also, if you break from one container into another container, you, you cannot do anything. So this is a pretty powerful security feature um, that users which care about security obviously um, make use of a lot. And it's also used on Travis again. And then we've worked on something called ShiftFS, which we uh, currently uh, 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 only carry as a Ubuntu specific kernel patch, but the intention is to make this available at some point in the upstream kernel as well. 
And this, for example, think of the case where you have containers with isolated ID mappings and you want to be able to expose uh, um, a, a disk device from the container, from the host to all of these containers. They all could, none of them could write to the actual, to the actual disk because their ID mappings would prevent them from doing so. With ShiftFS, it's basically a translation layer that allows you uh, uh, to make and enable these containers to actually write uh, to disk. Uh, so this is what we uh, this is what we do with uh, uh, with ShiftFS, and we are working on an upstream solution right there. Um, and uh, I think uh, this should cover more sort of a, a little deep dive into how system containers work. And Stefan will now go on to inform you a little bit more about our virtual machine implementation. And so on the on the VM side of things, um, it, it's still quite new to us. We've only been been doing that work for a bit of a year now, um, which is a quite a good thing because as the the new kid in the block, pretty much uh, as far as virtual machines goes, uh, we we get to build on all the new hardware and kernel features that have been landing over the past decade, pretty much. Um, and we also, because we don't have to care about legacy workloads so much, and we control most of the images running on those, uh, we, we got to to pick a lot of newer features and really build our story based on that. So Legacy runs uh, modern virtual machines. Yeah, that means the only firmware we support on, on Intel and ARM is UEFI. So it's we don't do legacy BIOS at all. Uh, we've got Secure Boot enabled by default. Uh, we do use Vertio devices uh, whenever possible. And right now, that means all the devices we have are virtual devices. They're not um, faked Intel or faked um, NEC or whatever else uh, devices that they're only using the, the modern Vertio uh, devices. We run on QMU 4.2 or higher. Uh, I think we're probably going to be bumping that to QMU 5 or higher, given what we're using these days. Um, the as far as the user is concerned, the handling of virtual machines is, as we mentioned earlier, near identical to to handling containers. You, the only difference is just you said type to virtual machine, pretty much. Uh, and so long as an image exists, it just works. There's like no particular VM knowledge that's that's required from any of our existing API clients. Uh, they can just by setting the flag virtual machine, they get a VM. But then the rest of the APIs for things like uh, executing commands, transferring files, all that stuff works the exact same way, um, which obviously is a bit of a challenge with virtual machines because unlike containers, you don't get to just go and like spawn processes and mess with their file system uh, as you want. But LexD uh, has a agent that you can run inside the virtual machine and which is bundled with all of our images. That agent communicates with LexD on the host and effectively lets the, the host system forward uh, API endpoints that could only be implemented inside of the virtual machine. So that's how we do exits, that's how we do file transfers, that's how we do uh, pulling detailed information about number of processes uh, running inside the system, all that kind of stuff. And all of that integrates seamlessly with uh, our existing features like network storage, projects, profiles. Uh, they're just, it's just a different instance type as far as we're concerned, but uh, pretty much all of our existing limits and restrictions and options apply the exact same way. Most of the device types also apply to virtual machines. The, the main difference really is that uh, you don't get away with doing like unlimited type limits. Like a virtual machine must have a set number of CPU and memory. Um, you can't just have it be whatever is free on the host, which is kind of what containers do by default. So for virtual machines, we default to one CPU, one gig of RAM, and then you can bump that to whatever you want through limits. Um, the other difference is that unlike a container where we can very easily reshape it and reconfigure it, it's a bit harder with virtual machines. So we're slowly adding um, live update options, but still the bulk of devices and configuration options on virtual machines right now will require a reboot of the VM that is. Um, we we do support like a bunch of the advanced stuff that Christian covered in uh, in containers. So things like uh, SIOV, we for uh, infinement and networking we supported for on well, infinement and Ethernet. We support it just fine with virtual machines, um, and that means we do VFIO effectively to 
pass PCI devices straight into virtual machines. Uh, we also support uh, VFIO pass-through of GPUs. So if you've got dedicated GPUs you want to pass to virtual machines, you can do that. Um, we currently don't do SRIO VR MDEV on, on top of GPUs, but that's coming soon, uh, which will then let you slice existing uh, GPUs and pass slices into virtual machines. Um, that being said, don't have your corpse up there. Like, no, pretty much no consumer grade card can do it. Um, some Intel cards are capable of doing basic MDEV. Um, but if you're looking at something more powerful, like an NVIDIA GPU, you're going to need uh, at least Quadro, if not a Tesla type card, to, to be able to get a uh, shared GPU with multiple virtual machines. So for those workload, for those cases, like you're probably a lot better off with containers because with those you can you totally get away with sharing a normal consumer grade GPU with multiple instances. All right, and um, now just on onto clustering. I, I promise we're we're pretty much done with the the speaking. We're gonna go to the actual uh, demo and tutorial part next. Um, so clustering is also some it's something we've had for quite a while now in Next Day, uh, probably coming up two and a half years or something or not. Um, effectively, the way it works is that LexD is capable of talking to other LexD demons uh, and has a built-in uh, distributed database. So you can configure one LexD system, then configure a second one and cluster them together, at which point the API will show you the aggregate of both. Um, and if you join more and more nodes, that just keeps growing. Uh, there's like no external dependency for this at all. Uh, it's it's all built into LexD, and our default database is already ready to, to be clustered right out of the box. Um, the API, as far as the user is concerned, is still the exact same one. The, it just feels like they're talking to a very large LexD as far as the, the number of things that, that are running on it. Um, but if they're, if they're not aware that it's a cluster, then things still work. The cluster will just pick whichever node has the, the uh, least amount of instances and then spawn things there for you. Um, if your client is aware of clustering, then it can figure out where a given instance is. It can move instances between cluster nodes. It can um, request an instance is spawned on a particular node. There's a bunch more features that are available if you're aware of clustering, but if you're not, it still works fine. Um, and that lets you, you know, scale to a very large very large size, like LexD, LexD clusters are meant to be about rack scale, so up to 40, 50-ish nodes. Um, but each of those is usually capable of running a couple of thousand containers. So you, you, you can quickly get to very, very large scales. And it's also where the work we've done around projects uh, starts making a lot of sense, because you don't really want your list of containers to include tens of thousands of entries. It's really a, it's going to take a long time to list that. Plus, it's also not going to be the most easy thing to read. And the likelihood of you like randomly getting conflicts or modifying a profile and impacting all your containers is pretty high. So that's where projects make a lot of sense. You can segment that cluster into, into some smaller chunks and then give individual projects to different software or different people. Uh, and they each get to, to do their own thing, modify their own config and not impact each other. Uh, we also support uh, mixed architectures um, so that you can have multiple different CPU architectures within the same cluster. And LexD will transparently deploy things on one or the other based on what's running the fewest, which is our default balancing me method. Or if you ask for a particular architecture for a given image, it will obviously pick uh, a suitable system for that. And you can also still target to, to force a given image to be, to be run on a specific machine of specific architecture. All right. So that was it for all the theory. Uh, we're going to go on to <laughs> something a lot more uh, hands-on now. Nice. Uh, let me let me already switch over the, well, you know, I'm just going to keep the, the slide up. And the first thing I'll do is well, I can kind of describe what we have. So um, we're going to be showing a demo of how to set up a home cluster. Uh, initially with three Raspberry Pis. So there are Raspberry Pi 4s, 8 gigs each uh, in this case. But you could use the one with less memory, especially if you don't care about virtual machines. Uh, I probably wouldn't recommend using the 1 gig one, but like 4 or 8 gigs are, are really the good ones, with 2 gigs being probably good enough. Um, so we've got those three Raspberry Pis. And also two Intel NUCs, which are uh, Intel, uh, obviously, based uh, CPUs. 
Uh, and we're going to be trying to, to cluster those together, uh, run some containers, virtual machines, uh, do some storage stuff, maybe play with stuff a bit, um, and, and just see how that can all behave. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I'll just join back from my phone and just show you what, what the hardware looks like downstairs. Be back. This is going to be interesting. Stefan usually has a lot of interesting hardware at home. OK. Uh, so I should be back from my phone now. Just going to be heading downstairs real quick and I'll show you what, what the stuff looks like down there. I can hear you very well. And so we'll probably do the others who are watching these videos. <laughs> well, it's about to get a bit noisy. <laughs> Basement is always a bit noisy, sorry about that. Uh, let me just flip around. Oops, there's my hand in front of it. Let me just flip around the webcam, the camera on the phone. There we go. OK, so that's what we're looking at here. Um, we've got, that's uh, Raspberry Pi 1, Raspberry Pi 2, Raspberry Pi 3. They're all in um, plastic enclosures uh, with a small fan, which is like one of the standard Raspberry Pi 4 kits. And then next to them, we've got the two Intel NUCs. So let me just head back up slowly, but uh, there we go. Um, I can just say that uh, both of, like all of them have uh, Ubuntu 2004 server basic images installed on them. Um, I did that ahead of time because like preparing SD cards is not really the most exciting thing to show in a talk. Um, and I've got SSH set up on them so that I can easily uh, show all of them going. Just close the phone now. And I'm back. So uh, let's switch over to, to that terminal. Here we go. And here we can see um, that we have a terminal connected to uh, RPI 01, 02, 03, and NUG 01 and 02. We'll start with the first, the first ones of the um, of the Raspberry Pis. Just move stuff around on my screen a bit. Yeah. And so out of the box on Ubuntu 24/7, LexD is already installed, but it's installed using our LTS branch. So that's why you can see here uh, four three. And for this demo, we're going to want to do a couple of things. So first off, we're going to want to enable ShiftFS, just to make things a bit smoother like, uh, later on by avoiding uh, needlessly shifting the file system. And then we'll, re we'll refresh to latest. So that's going to move us to LexD 4.6. We have a long history of uh, providing our users with a stable branch because a lot of our users actually care about staying on a stable branch that doesn't see a lot of the uh, feature development that we do. We only provide uh, bug fixes. This is a stance we had already taken with Lexi, and we're doing this with LexD as well. But if you want to get all, all of the cool stuff, um, then uh, switching to, in this case, for uh, for the snap switching for the latest channel is uh, is usually a good idea. Okay, so I've I've quickly done it on all the others too. So we're on four point six on this one. No, I, it will work better if I hit enter on the second command on those two. Let's do that. Okay, so while they do that, let's just do the initial setup on the first one. So we're going to be running Lexd init. And for anyone who's done that before, you might have seen that the first question is, do you want to do LexD clustering? And usually you do that, usually you answer no to that one. But today we're going to answer yes. Um, it asks for the name of the node, which is RPI01, it's fine. Uh, IP address of it, which I'm just going to make a quick note of so that it's easier to set up the next ones. OK. Um, and ask whether we're running an existing cluster, which we're not, it's a new one. So we can set up a password, let's do that. And now the clustering piece is effectively done for that machine. Now we're just moving on to configuring other things like um, storage in this case. We're going to go with the default of just doing a ZFS pool. Uh, we don't have a dedicated drive, which is a bit unfortunate 
because those Raspberry Pis effectively just run off their SD card, and that that is quite slow. Uh, but I don't have three external drives to to attach to them to to make them faster. So we're just going to be using built-in storage, uh, and we'll make it 20 gigs large. There we go. Uh, no remote storage at this point. And we're going to be using a virtual network that just comes with FlexD uh, and on Ubuntu, which is the Ubuntu fan. And that one does need to know what um, my subnet here is. There we go. So just enter that one. Most of them, the, the automatic mode works for that one. But in this case, because the NUX are actually on a different subnet, um, I need to give it the entire thing. Otherwise, it's they're not going to be able to communicate. So just fix that. And give it a few seconds. And we're done. So RPI01, so the first Raspberry Pi, is up and running. Uh, we can look, and we're going to say that it doesn't run anything yet, which is good. It's not supposed to. And we can see it in the cluster with nothing else. Now let's go on to Raspberry Pi 2. And you'll see that things go a bit faster as you add more nodes, because it doesn't ask you all those questions again. Um, most of the questions are cluster-wide, so it don't, doesn't make any sense to, to ask them again. OK, so name and IP is correct. We're joining an existing cluster this time around. So just going to be entering the IP of the first one we did. It shows you the fingerprint, which you could go and validate if you're worried that your traffic might be intercepted. Hmm. Uh, it asks for confirmation that there's nothing going on on the system, because LexD will be wiped, which is fine. It asks for the size of the pool we want, just in case it needs to vary between systems. They're all identical, so we'll go with 20 gigs, too. Um, and there is the source would be a block device if we had one. Again, don't have any on those Raspberry Pi, so I'm just going to go with empty. Pool name, also we don't care. Uh, just going to go forward. You did mention, you probably were mentioning, if Stefan didn't do it already, that if you are on, for example, on a single system um, and you just want to uh, initialize Lexi, like, that we also provide a, an automatic switch that does basically choose the same defaults for you. This is really uh, an advanced configuration of, of LexD. And we also support initializing LexD from a, a predefined uh, config file in YAML format. Yeah, we can, we can show the YAML in the next one to just show the output. But yeah, the last questions are of an interactive LexD in it is, do you want the YAML, which you can then use to just preceded it um, on, the, on other systems? So now we can see that second node was done. And on that one, if I do LexD cluster list, now we see that we've got two nodes on the cluster. You're also not going to notice that the database is only active on the first one. It's because our database is a distributed database based on Raft. And for Raft to work, you need a quorum. And you can't have a quorum when, you're, when you have two systems. Uh, so instead of putting the database on both of them and then having the entire thing fall apart if either of them dies, um, instead, we're keeping the database running on just the first node until you join a third one. So that's what we'll see now if we go on that one. That's the third Raspberry Pi. OK, so would you like to use clustering? Yes. IP is fine. We're joining an existing cluster. The IP address. Fingerprint hasn't changed last time around. Uh, can wipe the entire system. It's fine. No source, no ZFS pool name. And the size is 20 gigs. And this time, let's print the YAML. So you can do yes. And what it shows you is the the YAML you could use to then reproduce that setup. So it shows the cluster details, the answers to those questions I gave, the cluster certificates, uh, who the target is, and what the password is that I entered. Good thing I didn't put anything particularly confidential in that password. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we've got, let's just clear the screen. Um, we've got a cluster of three, and we're going to see the database is now replicated. So all three have it. Uh, which means we can reboot only one of the three and still have a perfectly functional database. With that done, um, we'll, we'll do the Nux in, bit, in a bit for now. Let's just do the most basic launching an Ubuntu 2004 container and call it C1. So that's just going to be downloading. That's, that's effectively picked a node for us, most likely the first one. So I expect it to actually run on RPI01, even though we spawned it from 03. Uh, that told it to download the image. The image is then being unpacked into a new ZFS uh, data set. And then the container is created and started from it. So what we just saw now, 
Um, the interesting thing is that uh, it gets faster as you as you do it again. So probably not in this case uh, because of the well, actually. I, I can make it fast. I'll do that after. But we can show that it's running. It's got an IP, and it's running on ArcPy01. Uh, and we can totally get that I mean, all inside it from ArcPy03, because everything is clustered, and we just the LexD API is constant and falls internally as needed. So that works just fine. Now, if I wanted to make it fast, uh, because we're by just creating a second one of those containers, uh, we can do it with time this time. And I'm going to uh, actually set the limit, because that's always interesting to show. Uh, so let's do two CPUs, two gigs of RAM. And if I was to just run it as it is now, it would pick another node, because it wants to use the least used one. And that would mean spawning it on RPI02, which doesn't have the image. So RPI02 would then get the image from RPI01 and unpack it in a new data set and then create, which would be slightly faster, but probably about as slow as we saw on the first one. But now if I tell it that I actually want it specifically on RPI01 that already has the image uh, and already has the data set, that should be pretty, pretty fast. Yeah, as we can see, three seconds later. Hi. As a reminder, this is not on a fast laptop or anything. This is on a small ARM development board. Like, it's this is on a Raspberry Pi. Yeah. Um, so that is pretty fast. Now, if we can easily see uh, what we have in C1. So in C1, I had the entirety of the memory, so 8 gigs. And we've got four CPUs. If we look at C2 that we did limit, and we look at CPU info, we only see two CPUs. And if we look at the memory, we've got 8 gigs, which is wrong. Uh, why do we have that much memory? Hmm, this is interesting. Anyway, uh, we'll have to figure that one out. Uh, let me make sure that the limit itself is applied. And it's just, it could just be an issue with um, the rendering yep. in CFS. So, yep. Or not. Huh, OK. So I did not know that. But apparently, um, so it's not like this fault. It's not the configuration's fault. It's a kernel limitation on the Raspberry Pi kernel, it looks like. So those those both are running the Ubuntu Raspberry Pi kernel. Um, and as you can see, there is no memory controller on that list. So that's the list of C group controllers, but there is no memory controller, which means you can't actually limit the memory. Uh, LexD will just ignore the limit because there's no way to do it. Or uh, interesting, could you go into the unified it, hierarchy? It should, it should actually have showed uh, in, the, in the log on startup that it's going to be yeah, we can see it towards the top of the screen. Couldn't find uh, the C group, uh, both block IO weight, UHDLV, memory controller, and memory swap controllers all couldn't be found on the mm -hmm. system. Um, and to answer Christian's question around the unified controller, no, I, do, I don't expect no, that to be. No, a, there's only memory not. pressure. This is always right. there, yeah. Yeah, so that makes that just explains why the limits didn't stick. Uh, we'll see it stick when we do the same thing on, on the NUX after, because on x86, we definitely have that, that in place. Um, the other thing we can show is uh, if we go into C2 uh, and we look at the disk, we can see all 20 gigs are accessible. Uh, and we can totally change that by just overriding the, the root disk and setting a size of 2 gigs, at which point we've got a size of 2 gigs. Nice. So that works perfectly fine. Uh, again, if now if we do a Lexi list, we can see um, the two containers running. And you see snapshot zero. Uh, you can create a new snapshot by just making a snapshot. Uh, that will have created a snapshot called snap zero. Yeah, we can see it down there. But you can also uh, set up a schedule for your snapshot, like so. So that's like a cron type pattern. And that says that every minute, we want a new snapshot of everything. So that's going to be interesting to see over the next few minutes. Now to show uh, different different operating systems, well, different Linux distros, uh, let's do Arch Linux. So we're call, creating a third container called C3 that's using the Arch Linux image. Um, because we placed two container uh, on RPI01, I'm definitely expecting this one to land on RPI02 or 03, with my guess being RPI02. We'll see that soon enough. 
again, I would expect this to be quite a bit faster if you had um, like a USB 3.1 drive or something connected to the Raspberry Pis. Me using a fast SD card is definitely not helping here. Hmm. Okay, so that got treated. And it's on RPI02. It's still booting up because it doesn't have an IP yet, actually. Now let's do CentOS 8 for good measure. And that one I would expect to then land on RPI03. Um, worth mentioning, like as you, you can always go on any of them because they're all clustered together. So I can do I can go on RPI01 and do a list and I'll see what's going on on the others. You can actually see some snapshots have started popping up now. Uh, the first one has two because I created one by hand, but the um, C2 and C3 already got their first, their first snapshot. And there's a good chance that C4 is running now. Nope, it's in our state, so it's probably being unpacked. Uh, let's go there. OK, it's done. So if we do it again, yep, yeah, it's running. All right, let's go back to RPI03. So we saw that. Um, now let's try virtual machines. That's where things are going to get a bit slower. Uh, let's first disable secure boot. Um, usually not necessarily a great thing to do on Intel uh, systems, but because we're mixing ARM and Intel in this case, and ARM secure boot is, while we support it, is not really supported by the vast majority of distros. Uh, images will just fail to start unless you go and manually configure each instance to disable it. So we'll just turn it off globally for now. And we we'll launch. So this is going to launch an Ubuntu uh, 2004 image. Call it v1. It has the dash dash vm flag, which is all that it really takes. Um, actually, let me use the same syntax as earlier, which was 2004, um, just to make the, the difference more, even a bit clearer. Uh, so dash dash vm says we want a virtual machine this time. Uh, two CPUs, two gigs of RAM. The image is larger um, because, as it turns out, the kernel firmware and bootloader accounts for the bulk of the, <laughs> like, usually accounts for, for almost as much space as the entirety of the root file system. So you often see virtual machine images that are about twice the size as container images. And that's despite the package selection being identical. Uh, it's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, it also takes a bit longer to unpack for. For a container, the the image is effective is usually a squash FS, which can be parallelly like yeah, unpacked in parallel quite fast. And it's just a bunch of files that you write to disk and make it through the page cache on Linux for caching. Uh, for virtual machines, we're dealing with a disk image. It's a block image of 10 gigs. Um, that's well of five gigs. Five gigs? Yeah, five gigs for images. Uh, which is quite heavily compressed, but still needs to be to be unpacked into a new block device, which in this case is going to be about 10 gigs large. Um, and once it's unpacked, we need to do some uh, partition table reshuffling to, to make it properly line up and make the, the GPT partition table make sense. So that always takes a little while. Uh, it's it's yeah. quite a bit faster on Intel, uh, but on, on Raspberry Pis, they're not <laughs> known for extremely good single core performance, which is what, yeah. we're, what we're doing here. <laughs> uh, and in this case, let's try to keep guessing. So it's not going to go on RPI01, because it, it has two instances. Uh, it's probably going to go on RPI02, I think. Uh, let's go see. So if I go on RPI02 and I look at the process list, yep, bingo, it's this one. Uh, we can see QMU image uh, DD that's running. So that's what's currently unpacking the compressed image into um, a ZFS uh, volume. Similarly to, to with, um, uh, with containers, if you create again, it's going to just reuse that pre-created volume. And it's going to be very fast. It's the initial creation that can take quite a while. Um, while that's going on, uh, let's start another one, um, because that's that should land on another machine. It's not going to land on 0 02. It will probably land on 0 03. So we might as well create two at the same time and just save some save ourselves a bit of time. So in this case, it's going to be an Alpine image uh, from the Edge channel. We'll call that V2. And I would expect it to land on 0 03. 
Alpine is a bit smaller than, than Ubuntu, so hopefully this one will, will be reasonably quick. Uh, oh, Alpi03 is returning. Yep. Nice. So it created V1 and it's starting it up now. So that's probably also something that's worth addressing. Uh, Raspberry Pi 4s, as you might be seeing right now, are totally capable of running virtual machines. Uh, they do have CPUs, uh, ARM64 CPUs with virtualization extensions. And so that's definitely what we're seeing here. Um, we can do console on V1, which will attach to the, the live text console of the, the booting instance. Um, that eventually will lead to, to a login prompt. There we go. Okay, so that's working. Now, if we do a list, we see V1 is running. Uh, we see its IP address. We see uh, that its network device is called ENP 5S0, and it already got a first snapshot. So it's really working the exact same way as containers, you can see. Um, because we've got the agent running inside it, you can do an exec and get the terminal. And this is running inside a virtual machine. Now, V2 should be starting soon, hopefully. Uh, it's still unpacking. And it's probably been, like, as I said, V1 is running on RPI02. Uh, V2 is going to be running on RPI03. So if we look at our own process list, there we go. We've got QMU burning through as much CPU as it possibly can to unpack this thing as quickly as possible, um, which will then be able to play with. Um, oh, looks like we're done. Yep. Creating V2, starting it. Oh, yeah. So that was quite a bit faster. Um, Way faster. Yeah. It helps when the image is a bit small. OK, um, so that's running. Let's just, for the sake of it, just do another run of V1. Uh, let's call it V1A. Um, no mem no limits. And we know that V1 is running on RPI02. So similarly to the containers, it just create another one on the same machine and just see how quickly that, that actually becomes. So the create should be pretty quick. Not as quick as containers, but close enough. Um, and starting always takes a little while because we need to actually uh, generate security profiles, load them up in a armor and a bunch of other things, and then spawn QMU, which also takes a, its time sometimes. But yeah, there you go. Uh, that's significantly faster than creating it from scratch. Uh, and because LexD uh, manages uh, image caching in the background, we'll automatically update images for you. Uh, if you pretty much always launch the same operating systems, you'll only see that, that time the first time around. Anything after that's going to be quite fast. Let's see what we have running now. Yep. And if I do V2 and I get terminal in the uh, V2. Oh, it looks like we don't have any working agent in uh, in Alpine. That's quite possible. Um, let's so we want a. This one should be mostly booted by now. Yeah. Okay. So that's we've got containers, virtual machines, and snapshots going now. Let's um, let's make things a bit more fun and play with the Nux as well. So if we do cluster list right now, we can see we've got three nodes. They're all running ARC64, so ARM64 bit. But let's add some Intel to the mix. So I'm doing the exact same thing I did on the Raspberry Pi, which is enable clustering, select the IP address, training an existing cluster, uh, copy paste the IP address of, of any of the um, Raspberry Pis, enter the password. Uh, wipe the data, it's fine. Source, we don't care, don't care, 20 gigs. I could actually go with a much larger size on those because the uh, the NUCs have uh, NVMe SSDs uh, that can hold oh. a lot more than the Raspberry Pis and also are significantly faster. But OK, uh, first one is done. Let's do the second one. Label clustering, yes, yes. Training cluster. Yep. And they are not crazy expensive. These Intel NUCs. I've never looked. Uh, I've never really looked into them. But uh... yeah, it depends on the configuration. They're they're not too bad. They're definitely not as low a price as like a Raspberry Pi for sure. Um, but they're also not too expensive. Yeah. And they're definitely they've got the advantage of being compact, which is nice to 
to have at home. Yeah. All right, so that's done. Uh, now let's look at cluster list again. Yep, we're done. So we've got the three Raspberry Pis and now the two NUCs. And we see they are x 64 so they're not running, um, not running ARM. The other thing you can see in there is that LexD only, because of uh, the way consensus works, we only try to run a database on three uh, cluster members. And in this case, the three initial ones. So the two joining NUCs don't have any database duty. Uh, that will change if we ever reboot one of the Raspberry Pis, because that role will then be handed over to one of the NUCs while it reboots, and will then only be transferred back once one of the NUCs uh, reboot. Anyway, so that's that part's done. Uh, now let's launch, because so those two NUCs are empty. They don't run any instances right now. Therefore, if I was to do another launch of C5 Ubuntu 20.04, chances are that's going to land on a NUC. And we see the image is being retrieved again. Uh, so it's being downloaded from one of the Raspberry Pis instead of uh, going to the internet. Because if we have it in the cluster, there's really no point in going to the internet again. And then launch. Uh, you might have noticed it's a bit faster. Uh, those machines are faster than Raspberry Pis. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can see it. It is here, C5 running NUG01. Uh, it's also worth noting that we, we've got a syntax to choose different columns here. So we can do columns and then say we want the name column, we want the state column, uh, IPv4, uh, and is it A for architecture? It is. So then now, uh, and I think we want, is it L for location? Oh, that's last used. Capital L, I think, is location. There we go. So now we can see uh, what we have running. Uh, let's do T. OK, so we can see what are the containers with our virtual machines, the architectures, and what they're running. Uh, so in this I'd case, like we can see that C5 is Intel 64-bit running on Nux01 and a container. I'd like to see a PowerPC a Raspberry Pi, please. <laughs> yeah, there, there was work on uh, our development boards for Power. Um, I'm not sure where that went, but it, it was a thing. Uh, let's do, yeah, let's do a virtual machine targeted directly. Uh, I'm not sure why I actually put to target it directly at NUC2, because we know, again, it's the one, it's not running anything, therefore it's obviously going to land on it. Um, so let's just do it on, on NUC2. So this time we're downloading the virtual machine image uh, on, on that second NUC, which is going to take a little while longer, because again, we need to unpack the virtual machine image. Um, so I do expect it to do a significantly faster job than the Raspberry Pi. And one thing that's that we can then we can do in parallel to kind of show how that works. Uh, if I was to say I want to launch Ubuntu twenty oh four, um, ARM sixty four, and call that what are we at C five now? Oh, C five already exists apparently. C six. Um, because I'm specifying what the architecture of the image is, uh, it's it will guarantee it's going to land on a Raspberry Pi. Was if I was to just say, give me Ubuntu 2004, well, you didn't tell LexD what architecture you want, so it doesn't care. It's just going to pick whichever system can run an Ubuntu 2004 and just run it yeah. there. Um, so that's how you actually force a given architecture is by specifying it directly on the image. So in this case, ARM64 must have landed on a Raspberry Pi. And if we do MD64 C7, that's going to have to land on a NUC. And yeah, no, to no surprise, uh, C6 is running on our Pi03. C7 is running on NUC01. And our VM is still unpacking. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that might be interesting is uh, during initial setup, I've opted to use the Ubuntu fan. So what that does is it effectively encodes the host IP in the, the overlay IP. So here we can see all of the containers have 240, 15, uh, or 16, then um, some number, and then some other number. So the 240 is the prefix. That's going to be always the same. The 15 or 16 comes from the IP address of the system. So if I do uh, the 4A, we can see this one is on 172.17.15.120. 
So all of its instances are going to be running on 240.15.120. something. And if you don't believe me, we can just grab that part of the IP, 17, 15, uh, 15 120. And that's going to be all the RPI threes. And the same is true for all of the others, uh, which means the, the kernel knows automatically where to route the traffic between them. And that means that if I exec into, say, a virtual machine on RPI 02, so that's v1. And let's say we ping C6, which is a container on, well, let's do a NUC, C5, which is a container on a NUC. It just works. Uh, normally, LexD also generates a DNS for you. So you can do c5.lexd. That kind of depends on the distro as far as how much that works. OK, it does work. Um, nice. And we should have our new shiny Intel VM running too. Yep, v3 is running. And if we go in there, this is running 5.4 kernel, Ubuntu 64-bit. So that's our shiny new virtual machine. OK, um, now let's just play with something that probably not everyone has, but always kind of fun to play with. Uh, I do have a Ceph cluster here. So that's distributed storage, um, which we use mostly for testing for LexD. Um, but you could possibly also deploy that on your Raspberry Pis. So you could have your three Raspberry Pis run Ceph and then use an external drive to have distributed storage amongst them, uh, and then configure LexD to use it. So let's do that. Uh, this is a script. Uh, why isn't it happy? I don't, I don't actually remember what the script does. So. Uh, OK, I see. Um, close enough to what we wanted to do. Um, oh, it's because Ceph snap. Is it Ceph that does the right thing? It is. There we go. OK, let's run the right script instead. So what that script does is it just uh, configures my Ceph credentials and Ceph cluster details on the systems. Um, not much point going into too many details about that, because that's very much going to be depending on your particular setup. But suffice to say, like it's now installed. And if we were to, for example, install the Ceph tools on, let's do one of the NUCs. Um, Ceph command just installs the tools. It doesn't actually install any of the, the daemons or anything, because we're just a client to that remote storage in this case. And now I can do Ceph status. We can see what we've got running. It's usually a bit of a mess, because as I said, that's the cluster we use for testing. Um, so our CI keeps creating stuff on it. But it's working, and I configured to use it. So now that we've got that in place, uh, let's tell LexD to use it. Um, that's the part that's a bit complicated, because storage uh, needs to be configured on a per node basis. And then once it's configured on all of them, um, be enabled globally. So in this case, what we'll do is add this new storage pool called remote. Uh, say it's backed by Ceph. Say what the name of the Ceph uh, pool should be. And then we need to target that at every one of the cluster nodes. So we do R by 1, R by 2, R by 3, echo 1, echo 2. OK, so now they all know the source for it. And then we can just do a global create, which will have the, the first one actually reach out to Ceph, create uh, all the objects that are needed, and then tell all the others that, hey, you're up and running, you're good. So that's what we're seeing here. And because that cluster also supports CephFS, which is the, um, so what we did right now is Ceph RBD, which is um, Redos Block Devices. So mm -hmm. that gets us, as the name implies, block devices. Um, we can also create file systems on Ceph with CephFS. That's going to gonna do that now. And again, do it on all the nodes. Like one, like two. It's kind of annoying having to do it that way um, for Ceph because it's going to be usually the same config, the same config on all of them, uh, unless you've got a really weird environment with different tierings or something on per by machine basis. Um, but for things like uh, non-distributed storage, if you were to add like another pool uh, based on uh, ZFS or LVM or something, it makes a lot of sense being able to configure it on a per node basis to specify what the block device is, for example, for each of them. In any case, um, this is created. So now we can see we've got three storage pools. In next day, we've got local. That's our ZFS-backed 
one that we've got everywhere and that we configured during um, init. Then we've got remote, which is a self block device, and we've got remote FS, which is self FS. What we're going to be doing now is um, create a new volume. So we'll create a volume called remote FS, uh, called, uh, uh, sorry, called shared on the remote FS pool. And we'll be using shift FS to make it attachable to uh, as many instances as we want at the same time to security shifted true. OK, that volume is created. Um, we could actually go in uh, volume set. Let's actually configure like a size on it, just for good measure. Let's put it at, I don't know, 15 gigs. There we go. And now let's modify our default profile to attach that particular volume. So as we'll do, we'll add a new device to the default profile, call the device shared. It's a disk. It comes from the remote FS pool. It's the volume itself is called shared, and we want to mount it in slash shared. OK, that's done. So now let's look at how things behave. Again, pull our container list, and let's go and see one. And let's look at what the uh, slash shared looks like. Hey, 20 gigs. It's mounted there. And this one is on RPI01. So let's do, uh, well, we create a file called foo, and we'll just echo the name of the, the container, I guess. Let's do that. OK. Uh, let's do C2. Where is C2? C2 is also RPI1. So we'd expect that to work for sure. Yeah. Uh, I suppose nice. I didn't write C2 in it for, just for kicks. But now the more interesting thing is that let's use uh, C3. C3 is on RPI2. It's not on RPI1. It's also a different distro. Uh, I can't remember what that was. It might be Arch Linux or something. Yeah, that works fine. OK, I mean, I could go on and on and on and show that it works everywhere. But let's maybe just pick a NUC. Uh, C5 is a NUC. So let's go at C5. Again, works fine. Um, now for the tricky part, uh, virtual machines. So uh, if we go in V1, you might notice the lack of a slash shared. That's normal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, virtual machines, um, not very good at uh, being updated live. Um, not sure that V2 will actually restart uh, because it seems a bit stuck. Let's just stop V2. And let's just restart the rest. So we'll start v1, v1, a, and v3. So as I mentioned earlier, virtual machines, we can't easily uh, do hot plug for everything. Uh, we're working on that. There's no good reason why this one we couldn't do hot plug, other than we didn't get around to it. Uh, we do have the agent inside the VM. So LexD could have told the agent, that's like, hey, there's a disk. Please do something about it. Um, but we don't yet. So restarting the VMs. Uh, we can do console on v1. OK, it started. Uh, yeah, I'll just get that shell inside it. I also just need to check something. All right, uh, so shell inside the VM and now uh, slash shared. Will you look at that? Neat. So I can write v1 in there. We can see it also shows as, uh, it actually shows 26 gig, which is slightly wrong. I'm not sure why that one doesn't show the right size. Um, there's a lot of different layers to actually expose it to the VM. So it's not too surprising that it might be a bit confused. Uh, oh, no, never mind. Uh, oh, I set it to 25 gigs earlier, didn't I? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what I did exactly. But uh, OK, so it does see the same thing as the containers, uh, same size. And we do see uh, that it shows us as V1. Oh, actually, I do remember what's going on. Uh, the Ceph version we use for the test cluster is still on Ceph 12, which does not implement the, the full um, quotas that we, we get in, I uh, think, 14 or 15. Uh, we've got another test cluster here that does it properly, which is why I was slightly surprised anyway. Um, so you can actually, with CephFS, you can actually start and share disks, not only ac across containers and virtual machines, but also across the entire cluster, which is really quite neat. Uh, the other thing, so if you were to just do it locally, you can still create a volume and you can still share it with whatever is running on the same machine. 
But obviously, if you try to attach it to something on a different machine, it won't work so well. And lastly, let's show starting a container on a Ceph volume. Uh, C6, what's wrong with this one? Uh, did we use C6 already? Oh, yeah, we did. Okay, maybe that's the issue. C8? No, that would work. <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's go and target something specific, maybe. All right, images. Did I make a typo somewhere? Is it the name of the the Ceph cluster is Ceph? Uh, it is not. That is a very good point. There we go. That should look better. <laughs> All right. So in this case, now what's going on is that we are unpacking a new volume on Ceph um, for that for that particular image, and then we'll be creating a in, in this case a new container from it. That was pretty quick. Um, where is it running? Is it running on ARM or is it running on Intel? Uh, C8 is running on Intel. It's on a NUC. OK. Um, and we can do the exact same thing with virtual machine. Uh, so let's do V4. And yeah, that should work fine. No idea what that's going to land. This one might be quite a bit slower. Um, while that's going on, um, let's see. I'm starting to wonder whether V4 was the right name. Yeah, V4 should be fine. OK. Um, so C8 is the, the container we just created, which is running on Ceph. We can see its root device here is attached to the remote storage. The cool thing with that is it's very cheap not to move it. So if we were to stop it, Now we can move it to a new target. Uh, because it's Intel, we obviously can't move it to a Raspberry Pi. That wouldn't work so well. Uh, but we can move it to the other NAC. And it's done. Uh, no data was actually moved in the process. The only thing that was changed is just a database entry and a couple of empty directories on the file system, pretty much, um, which is significantly faster than, than the alternative, which would be transferring the entire thing. So if we do C5, for example. C5 is stored on ZFS. Uh, let's move it. Uh, so C5 was on NUC1, so we're going to go to NUC2. So it's going to go the opposite direction. As I said, a bit slower. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a tiny bit. Yeah. That should still succeed, uh, unless we've got some. some we had kind of case I didn't think of. Um, but yeah, it can be quite a bit slow and uses our normal migration API. Um, hey, did it complete? It did. Right. So that did take a little while longer. And the intro startup would be a bit longer too, because now we need to actually act, start that uh, data set and start everything back up. Um, it does work, obviously. You can move things around just fine. But it is significantly faster when your storage is distributed. The other thing that's interesting that I can't super easily show here is um, where you to lose a system that's got containers or virtual machines stored on Ceph. So if it just goes down, loses power or something. Uh, so long as your cluster database functions, which it should because it's replicated, uh, you can go and move those instances to another system, even though the source system is no longer available. Again, because there's no, there's really nothing there. Uh, whereas in the other case, you obviously can't do that because you can't access the source storage, so you can't move the actual bits. OK, uh, I'm seeing a notification in the first time. And also, there's a good chance that our v4 is starting. It is. Yep, so v4 yep. is a virtual machine on Raspberry Pi 01, uh, which is going to be backed by Ceph. Oops, that v2, v4. Yep, remote disk. And the other thing that that's that can be quite nice. We we'll just wait for it to uh, to do its thing. Let's just do a console on it. Just see it boot. Um, 
the other thing that could, that can be quite nice here is that Ceph can give you uh, because that just says external one is quite large, uh, give you amount of storage that you couldn't normally do. So let's do let's stop it. And let's do config device override heavy for root size and let's do 80 gigs. Uh, whoops, not override. It's going to be a set in this case. That's cool. Okay. Um, and as a reminder, this is running on, where is it running? V4 is running on RPI1, but they're the same. So the Raspberry Pi only has 29 gigs of storage. So normally running a virtual machine with 80 gigs, not really an option, but yeah. because this is using remote storage, there's nothing wrong with it. Can't wait for a console. Uh, the last thing I just want to show before we wrap this up uh, is so far I've been doing all of that stuff from the, the, the systems themselves, but now let's just move back to my laptop and let's add a new remote in next day. So call it demo. And let's do the IP of that cluster. Okay. And now you can do so if I do LXC list, I'll see my own laptop. But I can switch remote in next day. So we can switch over to the demo remote. And now if I do list here, now I'm seeing the remote cluster from my laptop. Uh, we're gonna say that that V4 is currently starting. Yep, and it's starting with an IP and everything. Um, so if I go console, oops, doesn't really. Oh yeah, we would have a console open on it. Uh, but I can get a terminal inside it, and we can do partitions, and that shows that our disk is now 80 gigs large. So that worked fine. And uh, for one last trick to show, uh, LexD supports attaching attaching to the VGA console of virtual machines as well now. So we I can only do that from my laptop because obviously there's no graphical redirection or anything going on in the Raspberry Pis. So I'll do it on one of the instances now. Uh, what can I do? That's, let's do Intel because the graphic output tends to work better. Um, NUC02, let's do V3. So I'm going to be restarting uh, that instance called V3. Oops, that's not type, it's console. Okay, so this tells LexD to please restart that console, uh, that uh, that instance called V3, and once it starts back up, automatically attach to the VGA console, and show that to us. And I can show you. It just did it. I just need to move that over to there. Oh, this is unfortunate. No, there we go. So we we've got a <laughs> LexD branded firmware. And this is effectively open to 2004 starting up on, on this one. And it's probably done. So if we go and do uh, send key and switch to one of the dominings. Yeah, there we go. I've got a login prompt. And again, that's working. That cluster is running in my basement. I'm on my laptop, and I can use the LexD cluster uh, and its API to do things like attaching to any of the Instances, remote console, all of that stuff, and even VGA console in this case. All right, so I think that's it for the demo. Let's move back to some slides and wrap things up. Nice, so thanks, Stefan, for the demo. That was really cool. Uh, I like seeing stuff like that. It was really exciting. I might just built my own cluster right here. Um, so uh, let's quickly recap. I mean, we're almost out of time. Um, Choosing system containers or virtual machines, um, that's, a, that's a tough question. The advice that we can give is pick what's best suited for your, uh, suited for your workload um, because the management is really identical. And we also have a wide variety of images available for, um, so for both types. Um, obviously, with system containers, you will have less overhead than you have with virtual machines. Um, that's something to keep in mind uh, um, as well. Um, but it really, it really depends. It really depends on your workload, and probably also how much isolation from the host uh, you really 
want. In terms of security, it's a good question whether, it's just whether containers or virtual machines are more secure. There was always dictum that virtual machines are more secure than containers. I think with the recent uh, attacks and insecurities that we have seen both in CPUs and in general in the kernel, this is not necessarily true. Um, but yeah, so uh, base it on your workload. Uh, if you really are interested in scaling to a large number of machines, and we really made sure that this works out of the box, we have built-in clustering. Um, so uh, LexD essentially, multiple LexDs uh, act as a single LexD or as a single ent entity that is easily to manage, it's highly available, and it's really easily scalable. Um, and especially as Stefan has demoed, if you combine it with uh, Ceph, you get fault tolerance, and also you get a, a, a few nice um, other properties, such as, for example, when you move uh, virtual machines, which tend to be way larger than system containers most of the time, um, uh, between different machines that are on the same Ceph cluster, you get basically an almost instant move. Um, we have easy storage network, uh, GPU, and generic device pass-through. Um, the latter two are uh, mostly relevant for uh, containers at this point, but we're working at making this even uh, even easier and advancing this also with, uh, with virtual machines. Um, and there's a lot of work going on uh, on, on this front. Um, so you can at least for uh, uh, expose hardware easily uh, to containers at this moment. You can use quotas and limits to prevent abuse. This obviously applies to virtual machines and containers alike, as you have just uh, seen in the demo. And we work everywhere. Uh, so not just do we run on a wide variety of uh, Linux distributions, uh, we also run on all mainstream architectures. Um, all the ones that are still so that are still supported. I mean, we're basically just limited by uh, by the Go compiler. If you look at it from the LexD perspective, so if you wanted to, to run on Alpha, that probably wouldn't work. But simply because Go doesn't support it, there's te technically nothing that would prevent us from from actually doing this. But if you're talking at 390x PowerPC, uh, ARM uh, x86, that all just works out of the box. Um, and we also, and this is pretty nice, we have a client our client tool that talks to the LexD daemon uh, that is available for Windows and Mac. So you can have uh, you can have uh, the LexD daemon running on a dedicated server in your basement, but you can still use your Mac or Windows uh, uh, and to talk to it. Um, right, and because of this demo, you didn't really have time to do this, but like I could have showed uh, being on a Windows system and that last step I did, where like I added uh, the, the remote cluster on my laptop and then attached to the graphical console. I could have done that from uh, from macOS or from Windows, just the same. Indeed, um, and important uh, to know it's production ready, and we really mean this. Not just do we we do long term support uh, uh, for five years, and we've done this for a long, long time. Um, so uh, we've already done this with Lexi, with Lexi, and we still have versions of Lexi that we actively support and backport fixes to. This is really important to us. And so something where we have been reliable for a long, long amount of time. I mean, almost like over 12 years by now. Um, um, Lexi is, is younger. It has been around for over, uh, for over four years, but it follows the same model. We maintain long-term uh, long stable branches that we support for five years that we take care of, uh, that you can rely on, that will only see fixes, uh, no features, um, that we, where we don't regress anything. We're very responsive to issues. So if you come to us and point us to uh, something that you need fixed um, or that you think is a bug, uh, uh, we will be quick to respond and fix it. Um, and as you see, um, we also run in production, Chrome OS, Travis, there are a wide variety of other customers and, uh, uh, and users and users of LexDs, and um, we're pretty proud of this. And so, yeah, I hope this, uh, this whole workshop uh, gave you uh, um, an impression of how you can run your, home, your own uh, home cluster and you have learned about um, how we use containers and how we think system containers and virtual ma machines basically tell the same stories with a different uh, twist. Stefan, do you want to say a few closing words? No, that's pretty much it. I was going to say for the LTS, we currently support uh, 2.0, 3.0, and 4.0 of LexD as LTS branches in parallel. Uh, we only do uh, active bug fixing on the latest one. So uh, 4.0 is getting pretty much weekly uh, or sometimes even daily backports of bug fixes to it, and then we really start every few months. Uh, for 3.0 and 2.0, they're in security-only mode at this point, where we will 
we keep them buildable. We've done some minimal updates to to keep them working on newer kernels, for example. But otherwise, they're they're only supported from us uh, as far as fixing security issues if any should show up. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you like, if you're interested in you know paid professional support or whatnot on next day. Uh, works best on Ubuntu, you can, Ubuntu, because we work for Canonical, you can get a Ubuntu Advantage that conver that covers Next Day, and that also gets you a few extra features, um, like integration features that Next Day supports, for example, integrating with the um, role-based access control service that can come on some Ubuntu deployments. If you've got that set up already, then Next Day can integrate with it. Um, but otherwise, Next Day works the same everywhere on every distro. Uh, or even you know Chromebooks, Windows, Mac OS, and that's it. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, so if you've got any questions, you know, please go ahead and ask the around to to answer them. Um, there's our website there where you can try LexD for yourself online. Um, was also linked to our forum where we've got tutorials and a bunch of very helpful people that can help you uh, yep. set up your own lab. Uh, you know, goes through with you on the best storage or network or whatever setup uh, that that for your particular application. And yeah, thank you very much for for attending. Thank and you. Hopefully, we'll we'll see you around. <laughs>